you so much, Cindy. Um, that was a lovely introduction and um, quite honored to be a part of this initiative. Um, wherein, you know, it's always good to inspire people, to be a mentor, and also to pay it forward. So without further ado, what I'll do is I'll start sharing my screen. Uh, let me know if the voice isn't good enough. And so as Cindy's already given an introduction, but let me just complete the honors myself. My name is Dr. Ashutosh Kapoor, or you can call me Ash, simply enough. I'm an ST7, which is a short form of specialist trainee in diabetes and endocrinology and general internal medicine. We're going to go a bit deeper into what diabetes is, what endocrinology is, and don't worry, it won't be boring. It'll be the fun facts, the interesting parts to hopefully inspire a few of you, if not all, to take this field in the future. Um, I'm quite honored for Society for Technology and quite thankful to them for putting us in touch in the first instance. Um, so anyone who's passionate about endocrinology, do have a look. There are a lot of initiatives for medical students, for um, junior trainees, and even people who have a mindset of a clinical research. Have a look at Society for Endocrinology. I happen to be one of the endocrinology ambassadors and endocrine ambassadors for them. So um, Cindy will be quite helpful and provide you my contact details if anyone wants to get in touch. And thank you for being a collaboration for the Youth STEM Award for anyone who's working towards it. As you said, we can provide a reflection and you can obviously put in your portfolio. So just making it a bit more interactive and we've got quite a few polls going along as well. Simple things are simple. Uh, just have a guess or just garner a guess from where I could be from. So I've just made the poll live if everyone wants to um, put in their guesses. And we'll see what people come out with. We'll just give that a few minutes. Mm, so we're getting a bit of mainly India, a bit of United Kingdom. Does anyone else want to have a guess? Awesome. So that's everyone. So let me share the results. We've got majority say India. We've got one person saying Dubai and a couple saying United Kingdom. So where are you from, Ash? Cindy, to be honest, they've been quite accurate about it. Uh, it's a combination of all four. Um, I was born in Saudi Arabia, bred in Dubai, um, packaged over to India, uh, where I completed my undergraduation, aka MBBS, Bachelor of Medicine and Bachelor of Surgery. And then subsequently, moved over to the United Kingdom for my post-graduation training and then in the endeavor of becoming a consultant in diabetes and technology and general internal medicine. So it's a combination of all four, which just points towards the fact that, you know, the more your exposure is in different places, the more you learn about education, about science, about people's mindsets, and of course, medicine on the whole. So as I said, uh, the, one of the land of dreams, Dubai, um, that's where I've been bred in the sense that I complete my schooling, my parents are still based there, that's my home. Um, and, you know, my parents have been doctors. So my father's a cardiologist and my mom's an obs and gynae. Um, basically cardiology is part of the heart. It's specialty in heart and obs obstetrics and gynecology is all about uh, medicine related to pregnancy, women health, et cetera. And I always had an environment of science and medicine, which was quite a helping hand in inspiring me towards medicine. So Dubai is a hustling and bustling place. And essentially, in terms of schooling, um, I was part of a simple school called the Indian High School. Had around 10,000 kids over there. Um, interesting, I'm going to come to the slide in the next slide, which was my favorite subject. Uh, but in terms of schooling, we had a huge exposure to science in itself. I think my deciding factor was when I reached 11th standard. And that's when you, when you reach 11th standard, it's a, time where you decide which specialty or which branch you're going to take. So um, at the time, I took physics, chemistry, mathematics, and biology. Now, I'll come to later that mathematics was actually one of my favorite subjects and something I enjoyed a lot. But there's a difference of what you enjoy the most and what you want to do for the rest of your life. So that comes to the conundrum and the dilemma which I had at the time, um, which was biology versus mathematics. And it was it's not about which one was favorite. I enjoyed biology. I enjoyed the whole physiology and the mechanisms as to what happens in the human body. How do you go about uh, treating different conditions? 
But mathematics was something which I was pretty good at, um, at least at the time. Uh, obviously, with time, I wouldn't be as good now. Uh, but then there was the thought process of, Ash, what are you going to think of doing for the rest of your life? And I think before we're going to further slides, that's a message which goes to all of you. Um, try following what you love the most. What Because whatever you choose, you're going to stay with that or you're going to practice that for the rest of your life. So it should be something you enjoy. Because at the end of the day, if you enjoy something, work wouldn't be work anymore. It would be something you look forward to. Because you go to work, you feel that, oh, this is something is gratifying. It's something that makes you feel better. All right? So that's what you need to keep in mind when you choose a career. So for the people over here, as you remember, I finished my schooling in Dubai, but I was packaged over, went to India. Um, the conscious decision of going to India was, yes, my background was from India. But after quite a lot of research, um, I did recognize that you know India was one of the places where you would have a lot of exposure to all kinds of conditions, a plethora of diseases. Um, another conscious decision was just to open up myself. I'm a single child. So I, there was a part of me which felt that, you know what, it's time to venture out into the world, see what the world is actually, um, and go away from your protected environment. So I did my Bachelor of Medicine, Bachelor of Surgery in reputed college called Kastuba Medical College, which is in Manipal. Um, for anyone who's from India or anyone planning to go, it's one of the reputed colleges. It, it really encourages you to take part in research, publications, and it's quite an academic environment over there. The whole city, or rather the township in itself, is a cohort of medic medical students, engineering students, um, people studying architecture. So it's the whole township itself is full of students. So it's got a whole environment to it. It's pretty buzzing, positive vibes. That's how the place was. So life and career-wise, as I said, schooling was in Dubai, went over to India. Finally, after finishing all my years of um, medicine, when you know things got serious and it was crunch time where you had to make a decision of, okay, it's now or never. Uh, it's time to venture out further into the real world. Where do you go for post-graduation? I did weigh up my options. There was an option, United States, England. Um, as I said, my home's in Dubai. So there was a part of me which felt that, you know what? United Kingdom is slightly closer to home. Six and a half hours flight, not too bad. And you know what? I wanted to be a bit closer to my parents. Um, so I thought, you know what? Let's go for, to United Kingdom. Having said that, I am extremely happy and satisfied with the decision because United Kingdom is one of the places which provides a robust, a holistic approach of training. Um, the training program here is extremely, extremely, um, so I say, advantageous to people who are really inspired. If you want to go into research, they inspire you for that. If you want to you know, become a good leader as a doctor, that's another avenue which, is, um, which they give you the chance of exploring big time. So they're not training you just to be a doctor. They're tra training you to be a holistic, complete individual. Now, coming to the nitty-gritty, medical training. What is it a combination of? As you can see on your left, you've got the chromosome, the DNA, um, a photograph of that just showing what the DNA structure is. On the right, anyone wants to guess or anyone wants to garner any guesses as to what that is on the right, upper hand? And this is your time for interaction. You mean the, the green bit? Yep, the green bit. Ah, does anyone know what that is? Oh, ECG graph? Yes, ECG no. scan? Now, whoever's mentioned that, five stars out of five, absolutely. That's an ECG, which is an electrocardiogram. Um, not too much of medicine today, so don't want to make it um, too scientific, but it's just the simple electric rhythm and activity of the heart. All right? Uh, no points for guessing who the right lower person is. That's a doctor, <laughs> a young one at that. And any guesses for the left lower zone? What could that photograph be? The bottom left? Yes, the one which is black and white. X-ray of lungs is what X someone is saying, lung X-ray? We've, we've got a really good crowd over here. Absolutely. I think yeah, a few lungs. of you seem to be inspired for medicine already. Yes, that is a chest X to the lungs. We're not going to go if it's normal or abnormal, but absolutely. And I think that's a great start for anyone who wants to go into science and medicine further. So the point I'm trying to make by this side is medical training is a combination of, and it's an implementation of your theoretical knowledge in a practical aspect. 
you do the you study the science that's what your medical school is all about but then applying that in a practical aspect is all what medicine is about and about being a doctor so just to give a brief insight into my journey and my career in the uk um chronologically the first thing that comes up and what i am right now is a specialist trainee year 7 so um thankfully and by god's grace this is my final year of training um if all goes smooth and in diabetes and endocrinology and general internal medicine so another positive aspect of training in the uk is in medicine you most of the specialties dual train what that means is you're not only training to be a specialist in your field or your chosen field of passion but you're also training to be a, a general internal medic which basically means you have a holistic knowledge of how to treat different um etiologies or different conditions basically if somebody comes with chest pain you know how to do the bare minimum at least to keep them safe and to start off or instigate in treatment and management plan if somebody comes with shortness of breath you know that if somebody comes with abdominal pain or tummy pain you know that so that's a good thing because i've always felt as a doctor not only should you know your special your specialty but it's always important to be holistic should know you know it's almost like jack of all trades and master of one if anything um hopefully my current so rotation is just, i'm based sorry just want to ask before you move on is um so what do you become after you're no longer an st7 hmm. so um uh, as it stands if i progress to the next phase that's the end of my training and that's when you get something called as a certificate of completion of training which means you've completed your training which is a combination of four medical training at my time that's now changed to internal medicine training which is basically doing three years of general medical training and then you complete your specialist training in which you are training your specialty and general medicine you become a consultant so that's the final piece of the puzzle in which you become a consultant which is um you finish all your training and that's the final post that you get in your field and general medicine brilliant thank you perfect i i hope that helps india and i hope it's clear to everybody what the whole pathway is at this point but feel free to ask any doubts so my current rotation is be i'm based at imperial college health care nhs trust which is in london um currently based in st mary's hospital for imperial college um prior to this i was an i did my i started my st6 in northwest london so taking rewinding the years back my st 3 uh four five and six so st3 to st6 i was in northwest england um sorry bit of a typo there and i put it st4 to st6 because now people call it imt3 but my st3 to st6 was in northwest england which was in the manchester region um i took an interdisciplinary transfer i've come to northwest london and very thankful to the people over here people have been lovely um inspiring and the good part about the whole training program as i said is the more inspired you are the more you work hard people encourage you more so it's a positive effect yeah my co medical training was in northeast so I've, i think i've been all over the uk at some point <laughs> northeast is for people who um not aware of northeast england it's up in the hills in newcastle so it's that's the area newcastle gateshead had a very positive experience there especially in co training too and i think that's when things got really serious that okay um you like your specialty now how do you go about building a portfolio for your um specialty and i came to the uk back in june 2015 so time flies by honestly when you're busy um few milestones a few places where you want to be quite careful um now people entering in university the good part of uk training is there's an interview at every point so um not only are you being trained to be good at your profession or be at your subject but also being street smart about how you build up your portfolio how you you know strengthen your cv how you clear interviews and that's another skill to be had which actually i had a bit of difficulty and we're going to talk about this in future slides anyway having said that firstly uh, let me come to my field of passion and what i do on a day to day basis diabetes any thoughts what does the word mean to you uh, what is it all about anything and everything is accepted here so if you want to just put your answers in the chat box so again have you heard of diabetes and what have you heard is there anything that you know and want to share that you about this topic 
We'll just give that a couple minutes as well. Okay, so we've got someone saying, yeah, there's type one and type two. And we've got someone saying, body can't control the glucose levels. Some with diabetes have to take insulin injections um, when your body doesn't respond to the glucose. As another point, as a different point. That's what they see diabetes as. Um, type one is hereditary and type two is not. Then we've got another type one is the inability to produce insulin, whereas type two is resistance to insulin. Oh, we're getting some really good ones here. Risk factors are obesity or inheritance. Type one occurs as a result of an autoimmune response. Um, uh, are Asians at more risk of diabetes? Excellent. Um, very happily impressed by all the answers. And uh, clearly, we've got a very educated cohort with us who, all, if not all, some of them seem quite passionate about diabetes already. Um, mm. Broadly speaking, yes, type 1, type 2. But once you come down the rabbit hole of diabetes, there are many other variants. We're not going to go today into uh, a masterclass in diabetes. That's not what this presentation is about. But yes, you all have got a good knowledge base about what it is. And what you need to know today is diabetes is a condition or an a disease which is actually affecting all over um ethnicities risk factors being race obesity yes but you know what this is uh because the new technology is the advent of the novel therapies that we have trust me when i say the rates of detection the rates of treatment are have never been better than ever before and i think this is watch this space because this space is something that is ever so evolving and developing Yes, broadly speaking, type 1 is because of lack of insulin, type 2 is because of resistance. But again, there's a lot of crossover. And all you need to know is diabetes is a condition where the body is not able to handle the carbohydrate content. Now, there was a huge push about sugars and how much sugars are you having. But you know what? Carbohydrates are a different type of sugars. And that's what burns down into your sugars, actually. So it's all about carbs at this point of time. But you're absolutely right. I think, broadly speaking, that's what diabetes, diabetes is all about. Um, type 2, yes. Um, ethnicities, Asian ethnicities, Afro Caribbean, African ethnicities are at higher risk. But having said that, Caucasians, all ethnicities can have type 2 diabetes, which is more of insulin resistance, as you said. Perfect. So just going back in time, um, Anyone remembers when did act, when did diabetes start getting revolutionized? Or some of you have mentioned mentioned the words insulin. Um, any recollection? Anyone's got any idea in you know when century or when was insulin discovered? Good question. How long ago was insulin? Don't worry. Uh, you don't need to know. Hundred years. Getting there. Getting there. Yeah. What yeah. well, more or less? Almost. Um, I would say 98 years to be exact. I mean, with my maths being right, it was in 1924, in the 1920s to be specific. Uh, Frederick Bantick and Sir Ian McLeod um, doing the research in Canada. And that's how they discovered insulin. And that goes to show that 1924 isn't that far back. It's not It's not in your uh, 1800s or your 1700s or BCs that um, insulin was discovered. So as you can see, this is an ever-evolving field of science where even now we're discovering all kinds of new agents and medications to treat diabetes, um, especially type 2, especially type 2. You've got some new injectable therapies which help in weight loss, known as a GLP-1 agonist, which are once a week. You've got other medications which not only help the uh, blood sugars, but also help the kidneys and the heart. And in that same vein, you need to understand that diabetes is can only be treated in a holistic manner. Diabetes is a condition which affects the heart, affects the kidneys, the nerves, the eyes, the feet. So that's almost every part of your body, isn't it? And that's why um, I enjoy diabetes so much uh, in the sense of treating it because you get to focus on the patient in a holistic-centered approach. Fine. So I'm, I'm very glad that these slides have ended up being quite interactive and clearly the audience is very reciprocative of that. So 
have a look down what are the important tools below not expecting actual answers or actual names just what could they be used for <clears throat> so if it, any ideas what then as ash said what they use for what they're called just put in the chat box oh so we've got insulin injection blood sugar monitor mm -hmm. monitoring glucose levels insulin pump how are we doing oh we're doing glucose good. monitor yeah, we're doing very well, actually. So you're absolutely right. Um, there is a glucose monitor that's showing the blood sugar of 4.8. Uh, capillary blood sugar. I'll come to something called BMs in um, 30 seconds, actually. Insulin injections, yes. You've got the blood sugar strips. And essentially, this is one set of tools or one toolbox which every patient who, um, well, act, is on insulin should carry. Not Now, bear in mind, not everyone who's got type 2 diabetes would be on insulin. But type 1, that is still remains the gold standard of treatment. There are different kinds of insulin, long-acting and short-acting and um, pre-mixed insulins. But insulin remains still the gold standard for type 1 diabetes, where somebody clearly mentioned that's due to almost an absolute deficiency of insulin. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> in terms of blood sugar monitoring, there was... You might come across the term BMs. Has anyone heard of BMs? BMs. It, it, anyone who's been in a hospital environment or possibly clinic environment might have heard of BM. Hey, no, it does not ring a bell with me, but I don't know if anyone else knows in the chat box because, I mean, they're guessing some really good responses yeah, no, here. I, yeah. The level of questions have gone up because you guys have answered so well. Or oh, rather the level of interaction. I think we might be stumped on that one. Can no you way. give us a, it, it's a, the answer? It's a, this might be a positive thing, actually, because so if you go into when you become a doctor, um, whoever ends up being, you might you go into your hospital environment and you hear the nurses and everyone saying BMs. Now initially, when I came to the country, I was like, okay, this must be a blood metabolite or what does it start basal metabolism something, and they always say the BM is four, the BM is five, so it's referring to blood sugars, but. Obviously, when I started my training, I wanted to read up more about the history and see what's going on in diabetes. So back in the 1980s, actually, the company that started the BM strips was a German company or so, and the initials are BM. And that's what was so catchy about it. It ended up being BM. Having said that, that's why I tend to say, let's call it a blood glucose level, because that's much more accurate. So BM just stands for the company that actually started the strips, which is an interesting thing, um, which I found was interesting. But blood sugar or blood glucose levels are the more accurate terminology for the same um, etiology or same issue. So just a slide showing the history of diabetes milestones. Obviously, there's a lot more um, that must be, I have, I've missed out. So it's an extensive list, but not exhaustive by any stretch of imagination. Uh, 1889 was where pancreatic diabetes was discovered. Um, 1920s was when discovery of insulin happened. Then the purification insulin, subdivision of diabetes into type 1 and type 2, glucagon, which is actually the hormone that counteracts insulin. Um, you might have come across the terminology of glucagon. Yeah. Pancreatic transplants. <clears throat> then there's a treatment for diabetic blinding. Um, the blood test, which is routinely used to monitor somebody's blood sugars for long term control and as part of the average blood sugar control, is something called as HbA1c. HB stands for hemoglobin. So it's just a marker of three to four months turnover red blood cells. And that's how you can measure somebody's long-term blood sugar control over a three-month period. You get an HB1C. So maybe some of you might have come across the terminology or the term HBA1C. Human insulin being synthet synthesized, 1978. So that's a human insulin, but discovery insulin and the creation was long back. Then came the insulin pens, pump, and 2014 was when, or around that time, was when stem cell islet transplant was discovered. And this is a new type of technology where actually people are having islet cell transplants um, in which the diabetes can be helped, cured, or reversed. <clears throat> so, again, this is broadly speaking, uh, this is not going into the nitty gritty of what the variants could be, but broadly speaking, what is diabetes or what are the different forms of diabetes? 
So your body essentially needs insulin to transform glucose into different kinds of energy. For example, into uh, breaks down into proteins, into free fatty acids, into ketones, etc. Um, but your insulin is required. As you can see, insulin is the petrol, the fuel required to keep the wheels churning, which is glucose and energy. Now, when the pancreas, now the pancreas essentially is a, an endocrine and an exocrine hormone. My focus is predominantly endocrine. And in the same way, diabetes is not just a condition in itself, it's an endocrine condition because it's not able to produce enough insulin in type 1 diabetes. So it's a hormone issue. Very broadly speaking, it is a hormone, insulin, and it's a hormone issue. When the pancreas doesn't produce insulin, or broadly speaking, imagine if you give, you've been given a lot of work for a long period of time. And that's what type 2 diabetes is. The chronic stress on the pancreas for 10 years, 20 years, eventually what happens? The person ends up getting burnt out. Similarly, the pancreas gets burnt out, and after a long period of time in type 2 diabetes, they might not be able to produce insulin. So you might see a lot of people who've got type 2 diabetes, but they're still on their insulin injections, and that's the reason why. So there used to be terminology called insulin-dependent diabetes or non-insulin-dependent diabetes. That's out of fashion, and that's out of practice because it's not accurate. People with type 2 can be on injections, can very well need insulin, all right? And then there's, of course, one which is picked up in pregnancy and just when somebody's pregnant or during the gestational period, and that's known as gestational diabetes mellitus. Okay. So just to understand how big of a problem is diabetes or why we are focusing so much on the word diabetes, you need to see what the diabetes prevalence is. The site is slightly outdated by an ear, but nevertheless, in 2021, this is, this is how the word looked like in context of diabetes. Um, and the prevalence. Now, there are two terminologies, prevalence and incidence. As you know, incidence is the number of new people which are diagnosed. But prevalence is the total number of people across the board with a particular condition. <clears throat> so as you can see, diabetes prevalence here refers to the percentage of people aged 20 to 79 who have type 1 or type 2. You can see the Asian countries there. That's India, Pakistan. Um, UK has actually increased also quite a lot. As you can see, North America, US is quite prevalent for diabetes, South America, certain belts, Africa, Egypt happened the major chunk over there. And then, of course, my home, which was UAE and then Saudi Arabia, they've got major chunks as well. So I don't think there's any part in the, you know, in the globe which is completely spared of diabetes. But obviously, I'm happy to be corrected if I'm wrong. I'll just jump in there with a really good question. It's not to do with um where diabetes is, uh -huh. but it's a question on how likely are pregnant women to develop diabetes and are certain women at higher risk? That's a very good question. Whoever has a question. In fact, because this question has gone a bit more scientific, um, we have a whole section of risk stratification of people that you'd screen. So somebody who's previously had gestational diabetes, they are at higher risk. People of certain ethnicities, for example, as I mentioned, the Asian um ethnicity, African ethnicity, Afro-Caribbean ethnicity, and the Caribbean ethnicity, yes. People who've had or who've got a, a BMI, which is a body mass index above 30. So pre-pregnancy, if they've already got a BMI above 30, they are at higher risk. Um, people who've had previous, um, be, you know, if they've had a previous child who's been macrosomic. Now, macrosomic means above a certain weight. Generally, the cutoff is 4.5 kilograms. So all of these factors uh, do play a role in screening and at higher risk of developing gestational diabetes. Obviously, somebody who's had type 2 diabetes would be treated as type 2 diabetes and gestational diabetes during pregnancy. Uh, family history. So first degree relative, father, mother, somebody is known to have type 2 diabetes, they are at higher risk of having or acquiring gestational diabetes. So I hope that answers the question. Yeah, that's really good. Thank you. Excellent. But I'm happy with the questions are quite cerebral over here. Okay. So one question for me and now one question back at you. <laughs> um, these are some famous individuals who are known to have diabetes. Um, I'm, not, I'm not so much into football as much into cricket, which is, and thus it's been a bit of a disappointing day in that vein for me. <laughs> um, but Anyone wants to guess who these individuals are with diabetes? 
or have had diabetes at some point of, in their life, including gestation. So we've got Theresa May, Hillary Clinton, Nick Jonas. Lovely. Some really good guesses that people know. I mean, does not no one know the one on the left in the middle? I mean, he's an absolute that. legend. I had a tough time with that as well, so I might have forgotten. <gasps> Tom Hanks. There we go. And who are the other people then? Uh, Ash. Perfect. So most of you have correctly guessed it. So let's start from the right. Um, so they're the football players. Um, but most importantly, as you can see up is Nick Jonas. So he's actually got type 1 diabetes. And he runs, I think, a charitable yeah. organization to raise funds and money. And he does quite a lot of work in that area. So he's got type 1 diabetes, which means he is on insulin. Is that what you need to know? Salma Hayek, um, she had diabetes at one point as well. Uh, if I'm not wrong, it was during gestation, anyway. Then Tom Hanks, um, if not once, twice, Oscar winner. Um, I think one of his movies was Philadelphia and the other one being Forrest Gump, um, which is one of my all-time favorites. He's had diabetes. And of course, Theresa May, um, one of our ex-prime minister uh, in the U United Kingdom. And I don't know if you might have seen, might have appeared in media as well. She at some point was wearing um, something on her arm. Um, has anyone come across any new technologies in diabetes where you can actually scan something and find out sugars? Have you heard of that technology at all? And I know this is uh, way beyond the scope of these slides, but just out of interest. Dexcom? Okay. Um, it wasn't a Dexcom, but that's very good. Actually, that's very good. And now we're going into territories of diabetes and technology. Uh, what she had, or uh, what is commonly used now, is something called as a freestyle libre. Um, don't know if you've heard of that. Looking at the crowd, I, I'm pretty sure you must have heard of that. Um, so freestyle libre is actually something which is one of the common um, commonly used technologies now, and it's now, you know, approved all over for type one. Um, it doesn't actually measure your blood glucose. It measures the interstitial fluid glucose, which is a, but it's extremely useful for somebody who's got type one diabetes. You want to know the trends. You want to know whether they're dropping the blood sugars or what the exact trends of sugars have been. So as I said, diabetes is now revolutionary. And trust me when I say the patients are much more aware than what doctors can be at some points of time, because they're so on top of things. And that's what we love about it. It's, it's, a two-way process. It's not just a doctor-led um, initiative. It's doctors and patients both working hand in hand for a field of science. <clears throat> Some buzzwords for diabetes. Glucose, as we discussed. Pancreas, a big one. Endocrine. So that's what I keep saying. It's actually an endocrine condition in itself as well. And that's why I tell my peers and my mentees as well. Uh, Meditus, insulin, uh, respond. What does respond mean? Respond means response to treatment, and not just response to treatment, response to feedback, response to um, any new changes in medications. And it's a quid pro quo relationship, as I said. So the doctors and um, healthcare staff, oh, I'm not even, I haven't even gotten started on a huge cohort of diabetes families that we have in terms of we've got a diabetes specialist nurses, dietitians, clinical psychologists. Um, exercise consultants and um, experts. So as you can see, it's not just about medications. It's a whole branch in itself. And diet, lifestyle, so many modifications need to make. You might have come across something called Daphne, which is a very important course that most of people with type 1 diabetes, and I, I would say everyone should go through, dose adjustment for normal eating. It's an excellent course where people are educated about how to tackle day-to-day -day problems with type 1 diabetes. For example, if you're going out on an impromptu lunch, or you're going to work, or you're going to travel, or you're going to have some alcohol. I mean, it's exactly, as I said, there are so many structured educational programs, and that's why diabetes in itself is not just about medication. Nerve. Nerve is a condition called diabetic neuropathy. Long-standing diabetes, long-standing blood sugar issues can impair nerve endings, nerve fiber endings, and cause problems um, from that end as well. 
Right. So I think we were quite extensive about diabetes. Again, Cindy's monitoring the chat box very kindly. So if you want to put any questions, um, any thoughts about diabetes, go ahead and put that in the chat box. In the meantime, we're going to move to the second phase of what I do or what my feed involves is called endocrinology. I know the answers there, but you know what? I would like to know what your thoughts are on endocrinology. Because the best part about science is it's very subjective. Um, each one can have their own thoughts and there's no obvious right or wrong answer. So just to make sure that we also have some time at the end for some Q and A's, um, you might need to tell us more about it yourself, um, but we do have endocrine systems regulate hormones. So if you can tell us more. Perfect, thank you, Cindy. So yes, endocrinology, very broadly speaking, is basically the study of the hormones. Um, your body has a lot of endocrinological glands, so there's a huge cohort of glands that come in the endocrine system. Um, the master gland, the main master gland, is what lies in the brain called the pituitary gland, and that acts as the orchestrator for stimulating or inhibiting different glands to these different hormones. So you've got thyroid, you've got the pancreas, you've got, um, depending on gender, it's either testes or the ovaries. The penile gland does help you sleep. And the adrenal glands that has your emergency hormone called cortisol, which is the steroid hormone that is um, the, kind of the make or break hormone for the body as well. <clears throat> Essentially, they all counter regulate or regulate each other and they control the temperature, our sleep, our mood, our blood pressure. And, you know, in fact, our body and as a machine in itself. Very broadly speaking, the endocrino endocrinological system or the endocrine system is all about feedback. So if something, ideally, if something is high, then automatically it sends a negative feedback or negative response to say, you know what, I've got enough of this hormone. Can you just shut it down? And when I say feedback, all the signals, all the receptors end up finally going to the pituitary gland predominantly. When I say predominantly, um, that's not always the case, but from in the scope of these sites, what you need to know is the pituitary gland ends up regulating everything as a normal physiological response. Having said that, if the pituitary gland itself is not functioning well or properly, then obviously there's, that's a different story altogether. Okay. <clears throat> so you've heard about diabetes, you've heard about endocrinology. You can see a few photographs over here. Again, this is just barely scratching the surface. But what do you think a normal day in my life looks like, and a doctor's life looks like. <clears throat> so I believe this is what is uh, asking is involved in your role as well? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. What, are, what are the different um, challenges you face, or what are the different parts of the day that you know your day is subdivided into? Oh, I haven't made this a multiple choice, unfortunately. So um, if anyone thinks it's a multiple of these ones, if you want to add your answers in the chat box as well. Um, but it seems like the main thing that they believe you do is patient care and a lot of studying and a bit of research. Spot on. I mean, you all are spot on about all I'm of this. Well, someone says all of them. Well, whoever said all of them has absolutely um, hit it where it matters. Absolutely right. So. That's, that's exactly what I'm trying to say. Um, of course, we take care of patients. And especially when COVID came along, um, to be fair, it's still ongoing. But when it was at its peak back in the 2020, um, everyone was really deeply involved into research and all kinds of research because that was the need of the hour. Um, trying to find new medications, seeing how dexamethasone or steroids work, seeing new medications such as the interleukin-6 inhibitors, et cetera. The point I'm trying to make is um, these are continuous processes that happen in your day-to-day -day life. Patient care, studying, teaching. So not only you end up being a mentor, which I am, but you also are a mentee in different ways because you're always learning. And in fact, what I've learned is um, the more you progress, the more you end up studying because it's not just about exams. Then it's all about patient care and you want to give your all and you want to try your best to make sure that the patient is safe and has the best quality care possible. Uh, research, one reason why I've always loved and I've always been passionate about diabetes and endocrinology because is because 
the avenues for research are endless. I mean, um, anything from a randomized controlled trial to a case report to any publication, which I truly enjoy. And if somebody wants to get in touch for that, that's absolutely fine. It's something which is there in diabetes and technology. Now, there were a few options such as leadership, administrative roles. Actually, that's one thing which I was mentioning. So on the positive aspects of the training in the United Kingdom is you get the options of being all of these, um, along with you're able to make a difference. You're able to influence changes. You're able to participate in something called as quality improvement projects where, you know what? A problem is not just a problem. You want you find a problem, find a solution, implement it. And then, you know what? You made a change. You've recognized something. You made a change. And whatever helps in terms of patient care and even doctor care for that matter. It's a two-way process, as I said. I think that's a great po um, point to jump in with a question we've had about asking you, how do you think that living in different countries has affected you as a doctor? Okay. Um, it's a very good point. So I've worked as a, well, I've worked as an intern, um, which is quite as a foundation year one in India, and obviously did my medical schooling there. Seen quite a bit of medicine through the eyes of my parents in Dubai, and which is the Gulf, and here. You know what? Every place is different. But at the end of the day, one thing, uh, the common thread is patient care. At the end of the day, that's what I'm most comfortable at. Um, there is the government system, then there's a private system. But at the end of the day, the investigations remain quite pretty much similar to, similar to each other. And having said that, I think education, research, that comes in handy and is extremely important for all three of them or all, all the places that you've been because that's what treatment is all about. But I think the best part about being to do so many different places and if somebody wants to plan their electives in you know, Asia or India, you get to see a huge cohort of infectious diseases such as tuberculosis, malaria, um, you know, all kinds of weird and wonderful conditions as well, which broadens the spectrum and horizon of medical conditions and understanding. So I hope, Cindy, that kind of answers the question. Yeah, that's great. Thanks. <clears throat> Sorry. So we spoke about what our day looks like, or my day looks like, rather. But why would you want to choose diabetes and technology? Or why did I choose diabetes and technology? And, you know, it makes me a bit nostalgic because, time, as I said, time flies by. It just seems like a few years back. It was back in 2018 and uh, where... You know, I started my specialist training and essentially that was the interview question. And that will be your interview question anyway. When you choose medicine, when you choose your uh, specialty training, why do you want to choose a particular specialty? And you know what? I, I never framed an answer for this because it's something that came from heart. Um, it's just something which, you know, you form or formulate it as part of your commitment to specialty. Diabetes and endocrinology in particular I feel it's an extremely visceral branch. You have the scope for thinking, for brainstorming, for trying to find out what the underlying issue could be. It's abundant. I mean, um, there is no um, end to it. Passion for making a change in people's life or, or influencing people's lives and medical conditions is something which goes hand in hand to almost all the specialties. Academic and research opportunities, as I've very clearly pointed uh, to, are abundant in diabetes and technology. If you want to take part in publications, you want to take part in posters, case reports, trials, all of them do come um, in diabetes and technology. Now, another point which did um, resonate with me was viable therapeutic options. Diabetes and endocrinology is one of those fields where it takes a lot of brain power to diagnose something. But having said that, the, you know, the gratifying part is that there are a lot of treatment options. For example, if somebody's got a, an underactive thyroid, you have a treatment option. For example, levothyroxine, which is a thyroid hormone, essentially. Um, diabetes. I know, unfortunately, we can't reverse the condition, but you're able to treat it with you know, metformin or insulin. Or as I said, there are so many new medications right now. Once a week injections such as GLP-1 agonists or SGLT-2 inhibitors, which are the oral tablets. Point is, you have a lot of treatment options on top of diet and exercise. So that's why uh, diabetes and technology is something which always resonated with me. 
from final year of medical school. That's when it started uh, going, my clock started ticking towards diabetes and endocrinology. Um, sorry, might not be projecting very well, the left side, but as you can see, academic publications, you have the, you know, the world's your oyster. So you have the option of dreaming big. Yeah. Don't dream small, dream big, because if you, you know, I know it's a bit cliched, but if you uh, go for the stars, you reach the moon. Yeah. Um, as you can see, the buzz was there, publication, scientific options, research, scholarly, oh, lots of conferences. So actually, um, conferences aren't boring. That's one of the best places where you can actually end up networking. Um, I've made a lot of friends from that. I actually ended up having an interview with one of a friend now who actually went for one of the exams with and a conference with. So that's how networking happens. And United Kingdom is a pretty small place where almost everyone knows everybody. So you're not just a doctor, is what I'm trying to say. It's not just your, you know, I go to work, you know, pick up my stethoscope, listen to people's chests or treat their sugars, get their hormones sorted out. No, you have a lot more to play over there. And the more senior you get, that's actually, you know, it's actually ironical. The more senior you get, the other roles start increasing a lot more. That's when, you know, the hospital comes to you and like, oh, can this change be made? Is this something which you can improve upon? Uh, you start becoming part of guidelines formation. So it's it's a good place to be in. Uh, but obviously, you work your way through upwards in that direction. So leadership, what is leadership actually? You're providing guidance. You, you're a leader on a day-to-day -day basis. In fact, um, a junior doctor is a leader to somebody. So for example, let's say I have a foundation year to a colleague of mine. He or she is teaching or leading the way in a ward round or is teaching a junior face. That's being a leader. That's it. That's it. It's not about... so. It's not about being reaching the final goal. No, it's the process. The process itself is so enjoyable that the final goal will come eventually. All right. A uh, lot of uh, options. In, for example, if you want to be part of training and you want to take time out for doing a PhD or research, that itself is inculcated into the whole training program as well. So as long as you have a vision and a direction and are motivated, these things will fall into place for you. Cindy, I hope you're doing well on time. Yeah? I get carried away. <laughs> We're uh, running low, so it's only six minutes left. Um, okay. So maybe we'll skip the question, if you can give the answers to this one as well, and we'll move more quickly to where everyone can ask you questions about how you became a doctor Perfect. and anything else they have heard today. Perfect, Perfect. I'll get there. Uh, Skills-wise, again, it's a whole kaleidoscope of skills of Persistence, hard work, lateral thinking, um, you know, theoretical knowledge. Being intelligent is fine, yes. And look, everyone's IQ or brain power is different. But one thing I've seen is persistence. Pers look, can't be scared of failure. We all fall. We all, uh, you can't always succeed in the first time. But the people who I've seen the, being the most successful doctors are people who are persistent and saying, and are Whatever happens, I have to reach my goal. And I think that's the only thing I want to leave you with. Okay. Um, points can be up and down in life. That's how life is anyway. And of course, having empathy and sympathy, you know, being a good human being is the most important factor over here as well. Because at the end of the day, all of these skills are fine, but you are treating a human being. And that's what you need to bear in mind. And at times, you're not just treating a human being, you're treating the family as well. Because, you know, there's a lot of, expectations, a lot of pressure, but also you build relationships with people's families when you're caring for one particular individual. So as I said, I think I made, did mention the buzzword being persistence. Whatever your goal in life is, you know, whatever the pit stops are, never give up. Easier said than done, but you know what, as the turtle says, or sorry, turtle tortoise, nevertheless, try and stop me. Uh, Point being, if you remember the story of the hare uh, or the rabbit, whatever you want to say, and the turtle, even if you reach your goal slowly, all that matters is if you eventually reach it. Okay? So there's no rush. So just leaving you with a few key points and take-home messages. Do what you love, all right? And hopefully that ends up being love what you do. Never give up. Persistence is the key. 
in terms of science, and this is totally in terms of diabetes endocrinology, we barely brushed the surface. I mean, despite all of these advances, despite everything, there's so much, so much research going on that you know what you can participate in so many activities, even as a medical student and even as an undergraduate. All right. Make it happen, work hard, and dream big. That's pretty much my slide, Cindy. Um, and I hope Thank people have found so that much. a wee bit inspiring, if not completely. That is brilliant. Thank you so much, Ash. If you can stop sharing. Um, and then we've got a couple minutes left. If anyone has any questions for Ash before we go and that you have the rest of your evening. But that was so good. Thank you, Ash. I've, I've learned quite a bit and I'm impressed with how much knowledge people have about diabetes. Me too, and, um, to be and that's really, yeah. that's actually really reassuring that the future generation is in pretty safe hands now. Hopefully so. Yeah. And I really like that you reiterate that it's about compassion and empathy because you, you are dealing with people. And I'm sure sometimes that can be quite um, trying on you when you're dealing with that as well. And how do you um, cope with that? I think I can read the question, but Cindy, please do the honor. So how is the work and social life balance like? Do you have much of work social life? <laughs> it's a very good question. I think Tiana asked the question. It's an excellent question, actually. Um, and I didn't put a side on that. But you know what? Despite all the difficulties, despite the on calls, despite the out of hours, you know, you still have to maintain a work and life social balance. So my partner is actually a doctor. Now, each one to their own. I know a few of my colleagues who've gone out of the way that said, you know what, I'm doing medicine at work. I don't want to come back to that. For me, it was the one that, you know what, she would understand it better than anybody. That's just each one to their own. Yes, yes, you do have to work unsociable hours. For example, you're working on a weekend and all. But you know what? I've seen doctors enjoying the most as well. Don't let that put you off because you get your time off after night duties. There's a very good time where you're off on a Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So you can have a good time. You can relax. It's all about how you make or break it. So there do is... you have any hobbies then? Mm. Oh, yes. So I don't know if a few of you might have picked it up. Um, I do enjoy watching movies a lot. Um, so that's how I knew Tom Hanks <laughs> was to Oscar winner. Um, in fact, tomorrow I'm going to go for Black Panther, Wakanda Forever. Um, oh, dying to see <laughs> so... Hopefully that's a good movie. I've heard only good reviews about it. So yeah, I'm a huge MCU fan. Um, so we're not a boring lot is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> um, so yes, you need to have hobbies. In fact, actually, Cindy makes a very good point. You need to have hobbies because all work in no play makes Jack a dull boy. Um, point being, you'll end up burning out. You'll end up boring yourself if you don't end mm -hmm. up having some other hobbies. Um, I have a few friends who love traveling, love traveling. I mean, Every other weekend, whenever they're not working, they book um, an impromptu getaway to Europe and back. So, yeah, whatever works. That's fantastic. Well, as we're coming to the end, uh, thank you again, Ash, so much. And thank you, everyone who's attended. You've been a fantastic bunch and very interactive. And our next speaker is on the 8th of December. Again, just sign up on our Eventbrite. Um, Ash's talk will be available on YouTube and on its learning platform soon and on the Youth STEM Award website. Um, and you can watch it back again. In the meantime, if you do have any questions or concerns, I'm just going to put our email address in the chat box. Let me see if I can spell that right. Yep. It's a bit of a long one, but it's engage at welcomeconnectingscience.org. And if you have any further questions for Ash, please let me know and I will pass them on and he can see if he can answer them for you. But again, thank you so much, Ash. I'll give you a round of applause for everyone. Okay. And I hope you have a great evening. No, thank you very much, Cindy. The pleasure is all mine. And it's you had a wonderful crowd. And um, looks like, yeah, most of them are quite inspired for science. So that's, that's always a good sign. <laughs>